Are we alone in the universe? I very much doubt. Why? I'm not an expert in this subject, but I have talked to the experts in the subject. And I know enough about the universe, the non-life forms in the universe, like how many galaxies we have and how many star systems we have, and uh, what is the sort of how many exoplanets we have. And I would consider it incredibly improbable that there never was any life form anywhere else in the universe, and we are so special. That does not mean right now, here, today, somewhere, there is a contactable life form of similar civilization. But the question, in a broad sense, are we alone in the universe in all eternity? I would say the answer is no. And when, I, when you answered this question, what did you understand by the word we? I think of standard homo sapiens, most of my friends are homo sapiens, um, though you may, you may not want to qualify everybody to be that. And uh, uh, most of the people whom you interact with, standard carbon-based human beings. Standard carbon-based human beings. So you th use the word we to refer to homo sapiens then? Yes. Now sometimes the question in the question, are we alone, the we is terrestrial life in general. Yes. But you prefer to, to do? Yes. And why did you prefer? No, because I find that question to be the most important in the minds of the common man. Most of the common men, though they may be mildly excited by a future possibility, would not be so excited to see whatever the, you know, say amoeba or something in another exoplanet. But if you tell them something with which you can communicate and they can communicate to you, that kind of civilization exists, they consider it a more exciting possibility. So I think from a sociological perspective, that is a more relevant question. While from a scientific perspective, you should explore exoplanets even if there are no life forms, because it is interesting physics. I see. Now what happens if there are other life forms that are so sentient and so intelligent that they consider us not intelligent and non-sentient? That is perfectly possible. Does, does that mean we would still be alone? No, I think we, we would, uh, we would probably, I would say, in the limited context in which I answered the question, I would consider that that is not what I was answering. It could very well happen, and I would even conjecture that the results would be disastrous. Because if their thought processes are similar to ours, we know exactly what happened when a technologically advanced civilization came in contact with a technologically not so advanced civilization. Red Indians, Australian Aborigines, and all these people. The technologically advanced civilization hardly ever show any mercy on the other people. And this is exactly what will happen between Earthlings, Homo sapiens, and this uh, highly evolved, technologically advanced, but not emotionally advanced creatures. Arthur C. Clarke said that sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Yes. But there's a guy named Carl Schroeder who says, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. Well, this very much is semantics as to what you call nature. Because I would say nature is most magical. And therefore, both the guys are saying the same. <laughs> OK, all right. All right. Um, what do you know about aliens? Absolutely nothing. Have you ever seen one? No. Ever been abducted by one? I wish so. <laughs> you, no, wish, you wish you had been abducted. Yeah, it'll be a good adventure. <laughs> All right. Have you ever been visited by aliens in your dreams? No. Really? No. Do you have a favorite? My, my dreams, at least in the early days when I used to have very clear, coherent dreams, which I used to remember, were sufficiently mundane. Oh, so never any aliens. OK. Um, do you think the question, are we alone, is an important one? I think so. Why? In fact, I would say, first of all, I consider all questions of science and all inquiries into nature is important. OK? And uh, this might have slightly more practical relevance. And if we know the answer sufficiently early about some aliens whom we may not want to contact, that might even have some practical utility. So I think it is certainly important. But I, uh, I'm just curious about any questions about nature. All right. How about the scientific story of our genesis and the origin of the universe, the origin of the Earth, the origin of Homo sapiens? Do you, is that important? 
uh, you mean the scientific way we are looking at it, yes. evolution and all that put yes. together? Yes. Uh, what do you mean whether it is important? That is like asking well, whether Maxwell's equations are important. Oh, so some people think they're not. Yeah, I think it is. I think it, they are equ at the same phase. Okay, so I don't think Maxwell's equations are correct. We already know that there are quantum electrodynamical corrections to it. Yes. So the question of whether something is correct is to be distinguished from whether it is important. Right. They are definitely important. They may or may not be correct. Well, the reason that I'm asking this is because sometimes when you find out about your own origins, it undermines your traditional religious beliefs. Absolutely. And is that a good thing? I don't know whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It is an inevitable thing. We just move forward. All right, so, so do you think, I mean, the idea of teaching big history or the origin of the universe and the origin of the earth and the origin of the sun and galaxies, all of that, like cosmology and big history, that's something that really is not a part, a big part of a traditional curriculum in education, right? Uh, well, I'm not very sure. Because, for example, if you look at the undergraduate uh, textbooks in a routine university in India, you'll find that there is a section, you know, maybe two pages called Big Bang Cosmology. They're certainly made aware of that. Is evolution in there? Yes. The origin there is, of life? Darwinian theory of evolution is also, in fact, the debates in India, as far as I know, is far less than the debates in other places like United States. Uh, the places which was sort of, let us say, the Christian concept of Genesis has been, uh, the debates has been more heated compared to more peaceful religions like uh, probably Upanishadic philosophy or Zen. Do you think it makes uh, you a better person to know more about your origins? I don't, again, I have to worry about the semantics of that. Who is a better person? A better person would be someone who sort of gives more to the uh, world or nature or to others than takes from them. That would be my definition. From that definition, I think it, it has a prob higher probability of someone being better when he is more knowledgeable and when he knows more about anything. Okay. So knowledge is good. Knowledge is good. Um, what about multiverses? Do you think there are multiverses? And if there are, I guess there'd be more chance of aliens in the multiverse. Well, if you're talking strictly technically about the multiverse in the concept of string theory, the probability of contact with any of these multiverses are causally separated. In most sensible models of the string theory, therefore they are completely irrelevant. The chances of transition are quantum suppressed by the tunneling probabilities. Okay, so multiverses are, are not relevant to this question, are we Absolutely. alone? Absolutely. So even if they are over there, it's not important? Because, it's not important. So I guess only the aliens that are closest to us are most exactly. important. Exactly. Proxima Centauri is the place to look. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, based on the, uh, what, the ideas that you expressed earlier, you said, hey, a technological civilization, the record of them is just they usually kill and, and right. commit genocide. Um, and Stephen Hawking, based on this idea, the same idea, said, uh, you know, we should not send out messages to outer space, we should only listen. Some people think that's prudent, so other people think it's paranoia. What is your view? Uh, I really don't have a strong enough probabilistic calculation on how much we will reduce the risk of being massacred by an alien, insentient civilization by not sending out. Let me just give the same example again. When people in certain continent think that they want to explore other continents and they come across technologically not so advanced civilization, they just colonize that place. It could very well happen that some technologically advanced civilization, the outlaws in that place were put in a spaceship and sent off. But they are sufficiently clever and sufficiently advanced that they anyway discover Earth, okay? And all the consequences. So even if we do not send out signals, there is a probability for this to happen. And if we send out these signals, we obviously enhance the probability. But I'm not expert enough to comment. I very much doubt whether Stephen did the calculation either to comment by not doing this, what are the pros and cons. So I'm agnostic about it. Okay, so you're not in a position to make that decision, I guess. Neither is Stephen Hawking. <laughs> okay. All right, now in our universe, we have things like the speed of light and big G and this fine structure constant. Uh, do you think if we replayed the tape of life from a uh, tape of the origin of the universe as from as far back, I don't know, from the Planck time, do you think any of those constants would now be different? Uh, you mean in the same 
I didn't quite get the question, but we have an uh, ontological reality of a universe with certain constants. Right now, of yes. Of course, these constants run with energy scales under renormalization group okay. flow, but that is not what you are referring to. No, no. Okay, so they have a particular renormalization group flow and a particular value at a particular epoch. So what you mean is that when you run this again from Planck time with the presumably from the same Planck constants or constants normalized to unity with respect to the Planck scale, whether the values we get at some other time will be different. I'm trying to get a hold on what could have been different in this universe. That's the main part of the question. I very much, I, no, but the answer to the original question is no, because it is no because of mathematics. Well, you're talking about the run scaling of them. Exactly. I don't mean that. I mean, uh, uh, put that aside. Right. I don't want to, let's not concern ourselves with that, but right. how about could they have run in a different way or could they have started out in a different place or could the baryon, uh, uh, the matter-antimatter asymmetry, could that have been different, for example? Yeah, okay, so that, that I would translate, uh, if you agree, is into whether the laws of physics could be different, okay. right, in the universe. Okay. So that is a very interesting question as to, it is not so much as the choice of laws of physics as to what kind of structures nature would prefer. For example, Newtonian laws of mechanics is a perfectly consistent system, but nature chooses to ignore it. In a much more contemporary sense, steady state cosmology is an absolutely elegant model of the universe, which is completely contradicted by observations. So it seems that nature for its own or uh, her own reason seems to prefer something which we have not discovered yet. Right, but what you mentioned was a distribution created in humans' brains to try to asymptotically approach our reality. But what I'm really a addressing is, could nature have, is there some distribution of physical laws or constants out of which our universe is one example and there are, could have been other, it could have been else otherwise? No, obviously if you go around, I mean there is I believe a book by Tipler and John Barrow where they try to describe the anthropic universe, but forget the anthropic part of it. They do describe what happens to the universe if the parameters are changed how nucleosynthesis will change and how the C12 will not have the correct reaction for nucleosynthesis to proceed, the excited state will not exist, etc., etc. These are completely calculable consequences of the current laws of physics. But the real question to ask is, why can't I change the laws of physics? Why do you want to so peg yourself into values of the numerical constant? I consider it completely a very limited approach to the problem. Mm -hmm. Why not construct electromagnetism without gauge invariance? What would the world be? Don't worry about the fine structure constant. That is irrelevant. Change the laws of physics. I have an Aristotelian law of mechanics. dV by, the, instead of saying dV by dt is force, say dx by dt is force. You need force to make a particle move. What will be the consequences in that universe? I find that people have a very limited approach. They accept all the laws of physics. Oh, there is a constant here, there's a constant here, no. I want to change it. Yes. I, I find it fairly ridiculous. So you'd be- Very limited. Oh, very limited. And, and unimaginative. Okay, and in a more imaginative approach? You change the laws of physics. Now- I gave you an example no, in classical mechanics. No, 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 but you say you change it. What I'm, I'm not so interested in what human beings can change, but rather some human estimate of how different they could ha have nature could have been. Exactly. So you can have a human estimate of how nature could have been if the Newton's law of motion was replaced by third derivative of position with time is equal to force or first derivative of position with respect to time is equal to force. I find that a lot more interesting to explore than if fine structure constant is 1 over 138. <laughs> okay. Right? Now let's say Paddy and his crew are in a spaceship and they're in a suspended animation and they have a spaceship that might take them to another, a different part of the universe, maybe a different part, maybe a different sure. universe. And so you wake up, and how would, what kind of experiments would you do to verify that you are in a new universe or the old one? Oh, I, I have been, I, I presume the, the kind of uh, deep free state is something that when I come back, I come up with my uh, current knowledge of Landau lift shift 10 volumes. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, then I think it is fairly straightforward to check out various things like take a heavy ball and a small ball and drop and see whether they fall at the same time, whether principal equivalence holds and, if and things of that then kind. You're in a different if, <laughs> if not, it is fantastically exciting. You get a chance to play Einstein. Okay, all right. The reason I mention that is because in the, uh, have you seen the movie Planet of the Apes? No. No, okay. All right, how about uh, 
is this reality that we have around us, is that, could this be a simulation? Yes, I heard about that. And, uh, you know, the matrix sort of stuff. Uh, but again, I find people are very confused and confusing as regards, uh, as regards the semantics. For example, there is a point of view in Upanishadic philosophy and in Zen that there is an underlying reality which is like an ocean and all that you see is like waves in the ocean. Okay? And you know, it, it is all part of the same thing and you know, it comes and goes and each wave thinks it is an individual but you know, it is actually a part of the ocean and some enlightened beings know that there is an ocean underneath, others don't, blah, 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 blah. In that case, would you consider the waves to be a simulation of the ocean? Or a part of it. Is it the same as being a simulation? I don't know, you define it. Well, I would consider that is a somewhat more coherent picture. The simulation has certain manipulative angle to it. Yes. I don't think the ocean manipulates the waves. Okay. The laws of the ocean does govern the propagation of the waves. The laws of the ocean does describe how the waves will behave. But I, I would hesitate to call it manipulation. There's a computer center over there, presumably with students who are creating simulations of the universe in the past 50 years and over the next thousand or 10,000 or a million, they'll, these simulations will get more and that more sophisticated. That is the kind of simulation you have in mind. Well, that's one way, so. so that what? kind of, uh, if that is what we are talking about, my answer is no. I don't think it is a simulation in that sense. And what, how do you know? What makes you so sure? No, I, I, this is obviously in a realm of uh, speculation. So you have to use your intuition on that. And to the extent I understand the way nature seems to be behaving, this is my guess. That's your guess? Yes. Based on what type of intuition? Usually guesses and intuitive guesses are based on some feelings. What's the feeling? No, I, I find this concept of an ocean with waves on it a lot more, more, more appealing. cognizantly uh, tunable to me. Yeah. I see. Okay. So you think we are living in a simulation in the, same, in, in the sense of the surface of an ocean is like a simulation of the ocean. Right. Okay. Now, if I gave you $100 billion with the caveat, you have to spend this money to help answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? I really haven't thought about it. Mm -hmm. I think because any finite amount of money has to be used very carefully. $100 billion is a finite number. Yes. Okay, therefore, uh, you have to optimize as to what is the best way to do that. I would probably think, this is really talking through the hat of the cuff, probably you will think increasing the speed of spaceships, maybe nuclear propelled uh, spaceships, etc., where the spaceships can travel as close to the speed of light as possible, and then direct observation. So you want direct observations of planets that are nearby, specifically exactly. Alpha Zen. Exactly. That is I what I would probably Rather think. than increasing the sensitivity of radio searches. No, I think that is what I would. How about nano-aliens? Maybe there are nano-aliens all around us and we don't know them because we haven't searched nanospace with microscopes well enough. Yes. Uh, again, I don't know how to go about detecting it because I am not an expert. Cool. The only alien forms in Earth which I have seen are people who live, stand across a counter in airlines and in various places. I have a suspicion sometimes that they are alien species who have already taken over the Earth. Based on their power and their ignorance? Exactly. <laughs> More <laughs> on the ignorance than on the power. <laughs> you know, in, you have a brain. Inside your brain there are neurons. Yeah. Those neurons probably do not know that they're inside of your brain. Could it be the case that we are inside of an alien and don't know What it? exactly do you mean by a neuron knowing? Uh, well, I guess all life forms know things in very different ways. But and do we neurons know? What's that? Do neurons know? Well, do we know? Does a tree know? Does a There's dog a different know? Question. There are all kinds of different ways of knowing. Exactly. So uh, what is the knowing of a proton? I don't know, but a neuron is supposedly alive, so I'm putting this in the case of living things. They're sensitive. I, no, so I cannot answer that because I don't have a clear definition of knowing. I see. Okay. So. <laughs> because many of these questions become vacuous, answers okay. become more vacuous, yes. if terms are not very clearly specified. Okay. So the idea that we could be part of an alien is not well posed. It is not well posed. Okay, can you pose it better? No, no, <laughs> because there are so many possibilities and the answer depends on that. Yeah. Now, there's something called Fermi's Paradox. Yes, okay. uh, you, you explained it to me the other day. Do you day, have a yeah, favorite right. solution to that? Yes, my favorite solution is self-destruction. Self-destruction. Yeah. And 
Stephen Hawking said. But that I didn't think of it as self-destruction. Thank you very much for... I, I didn't know the literature in this subject. I'm uh -huh. very ignorant of that. Yeah, okay. So Stephen Hawking thinks made headlines about a few months ago saying, I don't think the human species will last more than a thousand years. I completely agree. Completely agree. Can you give us He's some... being a bit optimistic. So you put 500 years is what you would suggest. Yeah. And why do you... So you're disagreeing with Stephen Hawking by a factor of two. Yes. So that's based on what? Well, both Stephen Hawking and if I, if you really corner Stephen Hawking and ask what is the error bar on thousand, he will probably say factor of ten. Mm. Okay. So, so I don't think I'm really disagreeing with him. He didn't give an error bar. So, how do you think now? When you say to answer this Fermi paradox, you have to say this: this self-destruction has to be ubiquitous. It has to yes. be everywhere because yes. you can't just have one slip through. Absolutely. So, so I qualified it in the discussions we had the other day by saying that assuming the kind of aliens we are talking about have the same kind of neurochemical properties which we humans have, and they have the thought processes governed by these neurochemical properties which are similar, and their interactive sociology with other similar homo sapiens is somewhat similar, then I will give them 500 years after they dis uh, dis uh, discover atomic fission to self test Okay, so far in this discussion, uh, this interview, you've answered with the rational part of your brain. I'd like to talk to your emotional part for a second. So maybe if you could close your eyes and just turn on your emotions, what kind of aliens would you like to find? Uh, you know, there is a character in, uh, I think, Star Trek, who says, I do not guess. But <laughs> you must have seen very often that I did guess. But I really don't know what is the emotional part of my brain. You don't know the emotional part of your brain? Brain. I'm probably an ignorant idiot, but I don't know. You have feelings. Very little. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the little that you do have, yeah. talk to them and ask them what kind of aliens would they like to find? Uh, they tell me that what I like to have or not has absolutely no relevance to the reality out there. And therefore it is irrelevant to think about it. <laughs> okay. All right, and are, are we alone? I answered in the beginning, and I thought over the question again due to all your probing question. The answer remains the same. Okay. And so, are we alone? Uh, I don't think we are. And why? Because of probabilistic calculations, which I told you. But the probabilistic people, calculations you told me... Quoting has based on other people's knowledge. Other people's knowledge, and the people you're quoting, have to do with the number, the incredibly large, possibly infinite number of rocky planets. But there's also a calculation, or there's also the probability that, what about the origin of life? How likely is that? That's not something that we know very much about. That's so correct. no matter how many experts you've talked to, we don't know much about that. And yes. yet, you still say, we're probably not alone. No, I'm going by the mean with a very large variance in the form of opinions. There is a kind of a paradigm. I mean, there are a lot of things which we don't understand. I don't think quantum mechanics is the ultimately the correct theory, but it's a very workable hypothesis. So in the same sort of way, there is some kind of a canonical picture which we non-biologists have received from the loudest biologists. May not be the most correct biologist. And based on that picture, I claim that we are not likely to be alone. All right.